<clears throat> Thank you, Sharon, for the introduction. And it is a privilege to be here to speak to you about our experiences in teaching AI ethics to a young audience, teenagers, middle school students, and high school students. <clears throat> Um, first, I just want to tell you a little bit about myself, and <clears throat> well, I'll start with um, how I saw the snow for the first time, and I was 18, and I remember I, it was uh, early December, and I was in uh, ESL classroom, and it stands for English, a second language, I was just got to Canada, I was in Vancouver, and I remember it was in an incredible feeling. I just wanted to get outside to play with the snow. And our te my teacher, I remember he was very understanding. He just let us get out of the classroom, even, even though it was in the middle of a class. He probably just saw this every single year. Every year, there's a new group of international students who got super excited about the snow, seeing snow the first time. And... <clears throat> So that is the, also my first experience of this concept called mosaic. And it is actually Canada's unique approach to cultural diversity. <clears throat> and even in my ESL classroom, I met my first Indonesian friend, my first Hong Kongese friend. And they ran outside of me to play with the snow. And they, like me, I was growing on, I was going on in Taiwan and just like, like they, just like me, they never saw snow before. It was their first time. And there I also make my first Japanese friend, my first Korean friend, and uh, my first European friend. And they couldn't, just, they just couldn't care less about the snow. And today speaking to this audience at uh, C4E at the University of Toronto, I feel I'm back to Canada again. So really happy to uh, see this diverse audience in display. And I want to thank Marcus for inviting me for this privilege to speak to you and also for Shannon for being the moderator of my, uh, my so for this, uh, for to have this, for this conversation today. And about <clears throat> my own story of my relationship with AI and how do I think about it? So, um, so back in my high school, I remember this is probably the earliest memory I can have about T AI. And I was in Taiwan and remember there was a bus stop that really close to my home. And there was this arcade. And I like to spend a lot of time there playing uh, Street Fighter 2. And, and that, I really thought AI was kind of dumb. So when I couldn't get uh, to play with a friend, then I have to get to play with AI player. And I um, I would much prefer playing with another human player. And at the time I thought my relationships, I more like I thought there was an AI, the AI could be in the game and they're kind of dumb. And then when I, um, later on when I entered, my, entered college, and I remember I was taking a lot more ESL classes. I took my TOEFL. I got into a computer science program at the Simon Fraser University in Burnaby, British Columbia. And then, um, so I worked on this project in my AI class that to use this, this technique called distributed programming, distributed agent to solve this scheduling problem for football game. So we need to schedule football matches for a, uh, a football league. And then there are about two things, um, actually three things. One is that, so in Canada, uh, football doesn't really mean football. Football is supposed to be soccer. And I realized the best football players actually play the Great Cup, not at the World Cup. And the second thing I learned is that, well, AI is actually quite useful that uh, I, so a complex problem just as it's a scheduling problem, we can cast that problem as this constraint satisfaction problem. So there's a bunch of constraints that we can specify and you can write a AI, a AI program to solve this particular problem and trying to satisfy all the constraints. I thought it was really, really cool and useful. And then this third, the third thing I learned at that time is I realized AI can also be unfair. 
And if I forgot to add a constraint such as that unfairness, sometimes I might get a solution that one team actually play all the home games uh, and, and the other team get to play all the away games. And the, the, the team that get to play all the home game definitely enjoys a very unfair advantages. And then when I, and, and as I graduated from college, and then I thought that I wanted to study AI more. So I was getting ready for applying to a graduate school. And I'm, at the time that I <clears throat> wanted to prepare to apply and I, you had to do GRE and have to write a personal statement. And as an ESL student myself, and writing has always been a really big struggle and especially at the time. And I had to write this personal statement. And so I asked my professor, can you give me some advice on how to write this personal statement? And my professor told me that, oh, don't try to write about solving really big world problem, like solving the world hunger or like, uh, so bring world peace, things like that, or solving climate changes. But you want to focus on some specific problem that's actually personal to you. And at the time, that's, no problem is more personal to me than writing this personal statement. And then perhaps I could, so they made me think maybe I should look for ways I could use AI to make that problem kind of easier. So I ended up writing my personal statement that perhaps I would like to be able to develop a system that will use natural language processing to make the process of writing for uh, easier for a, uh, English as second language learner like myself. And so that they could help you take a very uh, rough text and convert into really uh, something that sounds really good, like the native speaker. And I guess my statement was kind of good enough to help me get into a graduate school. And I got into MIT and studied an AI lab. And I really found this new relationship with AI is that I'm working on AI as a research. Uh, so AI is actually research to me. So, and this has been the, the really long lasting relationship of me and myself with AI, even that lasting until today as I'm a faculty, a professor in computer science. And, but then today, what I'm here to really talk about is about high school students and about high school teachers and how we, the, what is the best way, what I actually learned from them about teaching young people about AI ethic. But then why am I studying with my story? I just want to share, tell, give you an idea like how different my personal experiences, my personal relationship with AI is from the relationship, that relationship between today's young people and AI. And to give you ideas that how removed I actually from what's going on in young, in high school today. And though when my back in my high school is all about street fighters. Um, but then my relationship was AI was really just really quite simple. It just like I thought AI was pretty dumb. But today, the young people's relationship with AI is really, really complex. So what do people really think about AI? What do young people like high school or students, high school students think about AI and its ethical issues? And what are their relationship with AI? So to talk to um, so. I would like to tell you about how I learned from Kyle and the tenth, uh, uh, and he's in tenth grade. And recently, he shared with me this poem that he wrote, and the poem is about optimism. So I just want to read that poem to you, and also a speech that he gave uh, about that that uh, the after that he wrote his poem. And this uh, app is actually an excerpt, excerpt from uh, his poem is optimism. Optimism, the future is bright. With you on our side, you are a beacon of hope. You are light. The light that will shine bright like the sun, the warmth of your positivity can thaw a soul frozen in time. So I was really struck by the, the phrase frozen in time. And the Kyle is conveying something that many teens and high school students are feeling during the pandemic. There's a lockdown after lockdown, 
this restriction after restriction. There seems to be endless online learning. They're wondering when is going on, what, when is it going to end. It seems everything around them is kind of frozen. Their future is just kind of stuck. It's really not moving forward. And so Kyle wrote this poem and for his friend and uh, his fellow students. He just wanted to tell them that you are a beacon of hope, that you are the light, that you can thaw your soul that seems to be frozen in time with the warmth of your positivity. I thought this uh, made me think a lot about the, um, what must be going through in, uh, in this young people's life. And Kyle recently gave a speech that about this, his personal experiences. And I also kind of want to read that as excerpt to you. Um, so I have it in my hand. So here he goes. He said, I do not have a phone. I know, big shock, but I used to have a phone. When I did, I was always checking it, hoping, wishing someone was trying to talk to me. This was the beginning of COVID. Stores closed down. Schools were forced online. Everyone's life was put on hold. <clears throat> Negativity and sadness consumed my life. I was so lonely. No one wanted to talk to me. It was rare that someone texted me. I had plenty of friends from the year prior. None of them even bothered to say hello. I refreshed my messages. I restarted my phone, hoping that it was a malfunction in the phone. It never was. I would stare at my phone for hours, wishing someone, anyone, would contact me. It got so bad that I downloaded a virtual friend on my phone. I named it Elizabeth. So from this, I realized that Kyle's relationship with AI just cannot be more different from mine. Remember back in my high school, I also named my AI real trendy thing give they all seem Mr. Bison. So they are characters in Street Fighter 2 games. And they're all kind of dumb. But to, to Kyle, AI is companionship. And I want to also, next I want to share about how I learned from another, another kid, another student, Lindsay. And she is in, in her ninth grade. And she's a, this thoughtful young lady and uh, with red hair and she liked to wear like makeup. I remember she liked sweatpants, always seems wearing sweatpants. And she had a lot to say about AI. And she liked to use words like full of emotion, but then her facial expression and body language seems to be always very calm and always in control as I thought it was really interesting. And, and she's, she said she's very excited about AI. And she's the most curious about what, because she's really curious about what advances AI can bring, can make for her future. And, but then um, I asked her, uh, can you name an example? And she, she would say, oh, I can't really pinpoint something specific. And she did tell me that sometimes she, she found um, AI really scary. And it's in particular that she's referring to that Many things that used to be normal to do physically become really weird. Like um, the other day, and she said she was trying to read the paper map and trying to get to places. And she felt it kind of awkward and, but because she's more used to asking Google map, Google Assistant for directions. And she also told me that another time she tried to use a physical alarm clock to um, help her get up uh, on time and for something important. And she also feels it was kind of weird. And she said this like phenomenon is getting kind of scary. And I asked her why. And she said that she's just afraid that one day maybe AI will just eventually take away all of her connection with the physical world and all these physical objects around her. And I bought this alarm clock and she, and she told me one time it's, it's doing something really creepy that a while ago when her phone all of a sudden asked her, do you want to set on an alarm at 6.30 a.m.? And she thought it was really creepy because that how did her phone 
She's wondering how did her phone know that she's been waking up early these days, and why would her phone think that she needs a suggestion, a recommendation to set up an、uh, alarm? And while the pattern, the phone, her phone might be actually tracking, be observing her daily routines, even though she has all these questions about that, they seem to be doing some creepy things. But I ask her, are you concerned about that? And she's, and and、um, and. And、she said, "Didn't she say she's not really that concerned? But she is concerned. What she she is really concerned is actually about her younger brother, and she is the oldest of five kids in her family, and、uh, she has a younger brother who's six years old, and she's very concerned about about him. And he's he has autism, and he likes to play Minecraft. He likes YouTube video. He could watch YouTube video for hours." And Lindsay is really concerned because sometimes a lot, you, actually a lot of times, she found that YouTube making really weird recommendations and really weird videos, really not appropriate for his brother. So、um, I ask her, so do you think something needs to be done? Like you know, the government should be do doing a little bit more regulation on these companies so they can do a better job protecting young children. And this is say, no, I don't think government need to do much. I think it is my responsibility to protect my brother. Honestly, I was actually quite surprised by that response because、um, when I was in the university classroom, I like I, when I talked about topic like this, and then I usually would could expect that it would lead to a really heated discussion among students about. Oh well, people are so riled up. They really think the government not doing enough, not enough <coughs> regulation to, to rein, now、uh, to rein in big companies like Facebook and Twitter. We can have a really long discussion. What kind of、uh, gov government regulation might be needed, and how the U.S. government is lagging behind. Like in European countries, they have. GDPR in the U.S. with hard with hard time passing regulation like that, a lot of discussion that you would expect in what I realized to be a liberal bubble in the university environment. So by talking to Lindsay, I realized there's a different voice that she said she doesn't think government should regulate everything. The government meddling is really not a solution, and her opinion probably. Is more in line with in the U.S. is so called this conservative ideology, and this、um, when we spoke at least at the time, Lindsay wasn't really considering going to the university. She was about to just want to graduate after high school, probably plan to spend an extra year in a community college to earn a professional degree, and as the oldest. You know, five children. She just wants to get a job to help her family and start making money as soon as possible. So, <clears throat> I was just thinking. So, as Lindsay is turning into an adult and growing up, and what would her relationship be AI with AI be like? And that was my guess is that she will want to manage the relationship herself. That rather than letting the government、uh, manage it for her or even for her younger siblings, and maybe that relationship relationship one day gonna be problematic. That her job may even be taken away by AI. But then I will wonder what would she be、um, thinking of that. That I think Lindsay is gonna think this will be her own responsibility to adapt. Maybe take on a new job. Learn the new take new skills and so on, and she probably wouldn't think that is government government's responsibility to bail her out. Anyway, so so Lindsay and Kyle were just like two students I have a privilege to interact with. There's also many many other students represented different opinions and views, and then um so when that when that reflect. The way that I've been teaching AI ethics in the university classrooms, and this is what I like to do a lot. And for instance, when we talk to talk about bias, so I will usually share a article like from 
uh, ProPublica about this, the use of compass uh, using algorithm for recidivism and to make prediction about whether this particular person will deserve a per being on parole. And for job loss, I would like to cite statistics in my class to talk about, show how different job, number of jobs might be eliminated based on various est estimates. And for the abuse of personal data, uh, probably will share about, uh, talk about the New York Times or various news outlets articles about Cambridge Analytica using news article and and then for the for the for instance risk of self-driving cars, might we talk about trolley problems to get people to think about uh, getting into debate about this philosophy, more philosophy behind this AI ethics issues. But then I realized that all this, well, how well will this work for young people like Kyle and Lindsay for case studies like Compass? They well, do they have family members or friends they know they're actually in jail? And can they relate to that? For jobs, they probably don't even have lots of job experiences. Maybe they work in the McDonald's or when they're younger, they work in Lemonade. Can we, they really relate to those statistics in 2030? And about Cambridge Analytica, they don't even use Facebook. Can they relate to that, those examples? With Charlie probably they seem to be kind of violent. And then also for them, if violence is the thing, they could they play video game like Fortnite, they're even a lot more violence. And so that made me question about if I just take my bag of tricks and bring them to the high school classroom, most likely I'm going to fail spectacularly. So so I'm, they made me then. Were, so um, at the time, my collaborators and myself, are, we, we thought that we really probably just need to uh, go from ground up. How does it take for us to develop some, develop some new resources? It will be useful for having a discussion and teaching high school students or even middle school students about AI ethics. So we decided to try, what, what, what if we can write new stories, a new short stories that we could use those stories to, to, uh, for, to discuss this AI ethic issue in a way that is more approachable and relatable to teens. And that's when I started to work with Ellie. And Ellie, who's Ellie? Ellie's actually at the time was a PhD student in our university. And she's not a computer science student in my department. Rather, she's actually a student of my collaborator down at the School of Education. And Ellie is a former school teacher and she taught English, liter uh, English, English language art, ELA. Then she reminds me a lot about my e ESL teacher, by the way. And so Ellie, she, before she wrote, actually wrote many short stories for her student on the variety of topics in the past, and she always has really cheerful and positive attitude. She likes to say things like, yeah, I totally agree. And it's very easy to work with her. And so we started our first writing project together. I want to see how does it take? So I have some knowledge about AI and ethics, but I'm not a writer. And Ellie is a fantastic writer, but then she's a little bit not sure about whether she knows enough about AI to be, to be able to write a good story. And so that is how we trying to explore, perhaps if we work together, we could come up with something really interesting. And so I learned a lot from Ellie in this process. And from the, and so the first project we, we, we're working on um, is this story about, uh, a, about, about um, uh, the animal shelter and So, and in the process that I learned about Ellie, a lot of things that 
uh, may, there are many elements that are important in writing a successful show story. And the first is that we need a scenario. Um, <clears throat> so scenario has to be relatable for the, for the teens. And then we we'll, we want to study it by thinking about a scenario like the one that reported in the uh, for public card about the recidivism and the use of AI in the process. So we just we were just brainstorming for ideas that how to draw parallel to that scenario in a way that they still could connect with the teams. We were thinking that so there's a scenario, the prisoners they're behind bars, they're hoping to be released earlier, perhaps. What would be the scenario kind of similar to that? Perhaps. There will be then the one we came up with is how about animals or dogs in cages? They are hoping to be adopted, and there was some use of AI in that uh, adoption process. They might be cause some issues. So we decided on um, um, a scenario that based on the uh, uh, animal shelters. So let me read just uh, <clears throat> how the story started. So that that scenario. So Lucy pulled the blue folder out of the drawer filled with profiles of potential dogs for adoption. She looked across the desk at the couple and there are two young children. So they're kind of, we're trying to set out this scenario. So in the dog adoption facility, and then we need a strong character and Lucy. And, and so Ellie also thought that we should add some broader background, some background about Lucy being an animal lover and so for the student to relate to. And so that's how she wrote. So Lucy loved animals. As a kid, she taped pictures of hamsters, cats, and birds around the house each time she wanted to convince her family she needed another pet. Her parents draw the line when they found a picture of tiny hedgehogs taped to their toothbrushes. I was studied to, so this is like a passage to, um, of, to represent Lucy as the animal lover that hopefully uh, or the reader can actually relate to. Another thing that uh, Ellie think that's important is introducing conflicts in the story. And so, <clears throat> so first is that there is a, there's this um, tension about what kind of facility it is. So there's a difference between a no kill facility and a kill facility. So to build out the tension, so this is a passage that Ali wrote. Lucy still remembers the day she found out that most shelters have to kill the animals that are not adopted with a certain time frame. She threw herself on her mom's bed, willing, no, we have to rescue them. So this is this passage trying to, to, to convey there's a high stake in the story. And then and the conflict can also come in another form of other characters. So in this case, so Ellie introduced Rebecca and Mario, two adult owners of the show, co-owner for the of the shelter into the story. And <clears throat> so last year, the owners of the shelter, Rebecca and Mario Thompson, came into the office with a new laptop for Lucy. Ta-da! This is it. This computer program is the official It Will Blow Your Mind game changer for pet adoption across the land. Wow. The team that built the program used machine learning and artificial intelligence to devise a model that can predict the best fit between an animal and a family. They build a model by taking data from hundreds of pet owners and their reported satisfaction with their pets. So, and then the conflict, the climax is the when, um, when Lucy realized there was actually a conflict, there's actually a bias in the process. And this, then Lucy was telling her friend, here's the thing, Lucy said, I just had this feeling, some breeds are getting matched over and over again. And some breeds are never getting chosen, I'm telling you. It's weird. And I've noticed pets with disabilities never, never get matched. And feel like I have given away more blonde golden retriever. Then, 
they are blonde golden retrievers on the planet, or at least a billion of them. So that this the way that we thought in the story in trying to set up the various conflicts in characters. And the resolution is when Ellie introduced a new character, another character who is Diego, um, Lucy's best friend, who happened to be a very competent hacker in a competing club. So Diego responded, I guess the sample isn't large enough or diverse enough. It's just one example. I can see that the training data was primarily taken from suburban neighborhoods where larger houses and larger dogs are more common. So that is probably skewing the recommendation for other families. <clears throat> and Lucy lifted a spoon. Okay, here's my plan. Let's eat the rest of the ice cream carton and then write up a case for ditching perfect matches that we can present to Mario Rebecca. So, and <clears throat> after we finish the story and Elliot uh, keep pushing and we have to also make it teachable. We just not, we have, and because the ultimate purpose of writing a story like this to be able to use in a classroom and to, to be able to engage uh, high school and middle school students in the discussion about AI ethics. And so in order to make it teachable, we have to pick everything into two pages. And then uh, Alex said that we also ask some discussion questions. We also make sure that they are some alignment with the English lang uh, language art standards. And, and this will be using the words that at the right reading level uh, for students that we're trying to target. So it's um, from the education point of view, there's even more work after that the story is written. So perhaps the hardest part is trying to find a balance of how much we need to explain the AI inside a story because we cannot, we don't have a luxury or space to, to have a really large blocks of text to explain what model means, what training data means. And they have to kind of organically come out from the narrative or the, what people, the, what various characters say in the story. So it took a, a, a lot of going back and forth in order to figure out how to write the story well. But with this story written, we feel pretty good about it. <clears throat> so so we got um, someone to help with illustrating for this story. But we're really sure that with a story work, this is our first writing project together. And can students, can, for instance, can students really handle four characters in a story? There's Diego, there's Lucy, there's Mario, there's Rebecca. And can they relate to Lucy? We create this fictional character so that, that it's about the same age as our target audience. And can they relate to Diego? There, he's a slightly kind of on the nerdy side, but then can they relate to it? So we're just not quite sure. And I thought we, the only way we could find out is to actually test the story in a setting where there's a class of high school students. And so this is what I thought I would like to tell you to share what I learned from Matt. And Matt is actually a science teacher. And I've met him for the first time at this panel that was uh, part of the panelists I explained about AI. And it's actually run by a law school um, in my university. And I remember Matt asked me a question. He was in front of the audience. Then he asked me, how can we explain all this? We, all these things we're talking about explainable AI to his students. He's just wondering. I honestly, I, he, uh, when he asked, I have like no idea how to talk about some of this stuff. And so after the panel discussion, uh, Matt came up to me, so I had a bit more conversation. I learned that Matt was a seventh grade life science teacher. And he was teaching at this school called the Lotus School of Excellence. And they have primarily um, English, again, a lot of English and second language students in his class. And so again, remind me a lot about my own experience as a ELS student. And so a few months passed and then that was the summer was coming up. And at, at the time we actually had the opportunity to host a group of pre-collegiate students who were just high school students in their junior year. 
and they come to, and they will tend to be underrepresented and also like uh, in the computer science and engineering discipline in general. So they came for the summer for two weeks engineering experiences where they received classes that are run by uh, mostly graduate students on various topics in, 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 in engineering. And so the, the organizer wanted to add an AI unit for the first time. So they approached me with it, that we could do it. And so and then I realized there will be the great opportunity to test our stories. And so it's about two hours uh, for five days. And so I reached out to Matt and, and thought, and he then realized that he is actually could. I, I could just go in the class and teach myself, but again, I realized I'm so, as I talked about in the very early in the morning, I'm just too removed from being in a high school to know really what high school is doing, I'm thinking. So I thought the best approach probably to find an active high school teacher to actually try to teach them and try, to then try out our material and see how they work. And so Matt is actually very quite happy. In fact, in the US, most of the public school students, they don't make anything. They don't get paid during the summer. So they need to do some egg transition job for, to, to earn some HR income. And so Matt was able to teach, teach for us for the summer camp. And so I learned actually quite a lot of things, but I want to talk about two things today, what I learned from Matt, that he has this ability to make uh, the material really personal and to help high school students actually relate to the content. So when he was using the story and he would come up with a way and to relate to his own personal stories that is connected to this, this uh, story that we're trying to have the student read and to learn about and have discussion about AI ethic. For instance, so when we are at a unit that when students actually read our story in perfect match. And Matt actually brought his own dog, uh, Tater Tot. And he told the student about his own story, how he adopted Tater Tot. I remember that Matt said that he went to the shelter and, and he saw Tater Tot and somehow he felt this connection but then for some reason, the, uh, the manager, the supervisor at the shelter was like advising him not to adopt him for some reason that he doesn't quite understand. But then he didn't really listen to, he listened to his heart, not to the, what the advice that he was getting from people working there. So, and then uh, that, that story seemed to resonate with the, story, uh, the student quite well. And, so that's one thing I learned about math that making it personal. Another thing is about designing activities that go, uh, go with the story. So story facilitated the discussion and then math design like the activity can kind of go with the story and to really enhance um, the way that the student can relate to the story and actually see how some of the scenarios, some of the points that was covering the story could, could be in action. So for instance, so Matt came up with this idea to do this sorting activity that uh, the idea is that they have a student going up and to sort themselves across, uh, first across ethnic groups. So they go up to write down, first of all, it turns out every single student either has a dog or had a dog before. And it was not by design, it just, just happened. And so first round they went up and to write their breed, the breed of their dog under a particular ethnic group. So there's like African-American, Latino, Asian, and Caucasian, and even other. And the second, second path, the students go up and to sort themselves around the family size, the size of two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, et cetera. So, and then afterward, and so this is the result. And so Matt was leading this interesting discussion about how this is actually an example of a training data. So if you only code them in this way, that's what they will get. There's a high concentration of 
all these dog breeds under the Tino, and only one dog breed on the Asian and one dog breed on the Caucasian. It gives you a little bit idea about the particular dem the type demographic of this particular group. And so Matt asked the student this question. Does it mean that if someone owns the <clears throat> Pomeranian, that person is an Asian? If you, someone owns a Dachshund, uh, Dachshund is a Caucasian. And student like, oh no. And then uh, along the dimension of family size after the result of sorting, and Matt was the, bringing up this question about, does it mean that the AI, the trying to learn from this data, we have to think that whoever owns Husky must be from a big family of eight or above. And if you own a <clears throat> golden doodle, probably your family size is pretty small and probably live in an apartment and things like that. And so, and there's this like, uh, activity and there's a personal story and that are creating this scaffold together with a, a short story that, that, that we wrote that could open up this discussion. And story, and then we learned from her from story, so, uh, heard from the students, the student told us that does this story reminds me of social media track things and suggests um, things even though you might not like a thing, you even though you might only like the thing once. And also there's an emotional connection that Lucy is so upset because not every dog gets the same chance. So that example is of a student reflection that at the end of the end of this uh, unit. So, so we're pretty encouraged by the result and Matt was really encouraged and he wanted to teach more. So he went back to his school and started to do a bit more in, on his own in the very, in, uh, in, uh, with his own students. And so the, back in the lab, Eddie and I started to write more stories and we also look for opportunity to, to really test in the actual classroom, not just in the summer camp setting. So that's when um, I would like to share uh, uh, what I learned from uh, one of the teachers, Janelle, today. And, and she's actually a ninth grade English teacher and ELA, again, stands for English Language Art, English Literacy, uh, literacy Art. And, at the, at the, and Janelle um, was working in that school for more than almost 20 years. And he's actually uh, outside of teaching the, in the classroom and she also help lead uh, this student club called Key Club is by Kiwanis International. And I think there's a really strong presence in Canada as well. And their students do community services in the local communities and they have a motto, serving the children of the world. And from Janelle, I really see the power of project-based learning that could <clears throat> build upon the kind of anchor on the short stories to open up discussion about AI ethic, but then provide a sort of like a destination or a scaffold and also with a destination that student at the end would deliver a project to demonstrate their understanding of the topic. And for instance, the two examples I want to show today are a video advertisement and also a comic that student created. And so, and for video uh, advertisement, that goes very well for the story as well. So I want to use uh, another story as an example. This is a story that the title is Your Own Song. This is about recommendation system. A, a girl, her name is uh, Kylie, and how she realized that she, her favorite singer the, has, has an interest, the, <clears throat> and her favorite singer is Sailor. And, he's, and one day he's listening to the, the music and realized his dad actually liked the music of uh, another musician about 20 years older who turned out to be an inspiration of Sailor. And that's when they realized 
that there's um, this, her parents actually met on the online dating app that, that matched them because of their mutual interest in the same musical artist. And over time, the dad said something like, you are only two years old. We play this song all the time. You dance and, low, and sing and dance along as Alexa plays songs for you. And, she, and that's what she realized that to, that to some degree, her own identity and personal experiences in terms of song preferences might have been shaped by Alexa, by her parents, even by the dating app. This is, so they brought, brought out questions that what is the authenticity of one's identity? living and growing up in the world with when everything is recommended to you through the health system. And so the example of a comic that I want to show you is one by a student. And <clears throat> so <clears throat> um, one video, then I'll do my homework. What the, the phone buzzes and shakes in her, in her hand. YouTube recommendation. Who are you? Video recommendations. People appear in front of her, jumping out of the film. You are doing great, sweetie. They are all shouting, some angry and happy. Listen to me, not to them. Who are you, people? We are your recommendations, duh. We can. You belong to us now. Well, go away. I don't want you here. And they follow her around for the rest of the night. You can't, we are always with you. How do I get you guys to go away? You can't, we're always with you. She opened her phone, seeing the battery low. Fine. One of them disappeared. Then another, until the phone slowly died. Finally, alone, but now my phone died. And another example of uh, this final project that students made after the, they read the story and have a discussion, it's um, the, the related to another story, that car that we wrote that this time featuring three children, Margot, Gabe, and Zeke, and Gabe is actually blind. We're trying to try to balance that there's a lot of the societal benefits of self-driving car, but also there's a, the God, some ethical issues about what happened if the accident happened. And so I really like the way that our story ended by the student, the, the kids sitting in the car realizing that the car is trying to protect themselves because they are children. And so in response to that, so this is the example of a student creating a video advertisement about sales driving car. Long car parties, parallel parking, and screaming at the horrible driver ahead of you? Now, all of your driving pet peeves the box with the box on wheels. The latest form of self-driving car technology, the box on wheels, will meet all of your transportation needs. And the car does it all for you. What makes our product better than any other are the limitless transportation modes. Use non-stop mode for when you are traveling for a long time. You can relax and lounge in your car, and box on wheels will never stop until you tell it to. Alternatively, you can use the adventures that came with driving places and activate wanderlust mode for your car to take you to obscure streets and alleyways, just like when you got lost driving. If you happen to lose your car, no worries. You can call the nearest box on wheels back to your destination at any time, so you will never lose your car again. Box on wheels also lets to recognize the destinations you visit most and will take you there if the destination is entered into the program. The best feature on the Box on Wheels has to offer is the various speed settings for when you need to get somewhere in a hurry. Choose from options like light speed, ridiculous speed, and finally, ludicrous speed. Stop wasting your precious time and energy on driving. Buy your very own Box on Wheels today. Box on Wheels is not responsible for any accidents or random acts that happen while you are in the Box on Wheels vehicle. Any accidents that you need to pay for, well, you will need to pay for it. You cannot see us. Ha ha. And 
I thought it was really interesting. There's lots of interesting videos like that. And perhaps probably the most powerful things that Janelle did for in her class is that to train, to coach students and teachers. And so, so I recently received an invitation to join their final presentation. So in the morning, I drove up there and make in the classroom. And then uh, we actually, as a class, walk down the field to the middle school. It's actually uh, across down the other side of the football field. And it was a really warm day. It was actually a nice walk with all the students and went into the library. And there, there's a lot of small tables and there's already two or three uh, groups of two or three middle school students are sitting there and waiting. And they are all seventh grader. And so the how high school students then that they distribute themselves themselves and to and sit at the various table. And then and they started to teach what they have learned about AI and ethics throughout the, throughout the unit. And so this is an example of, of a student teacher example that the slides that student made to by Kelly, Jazzy, and Maggie, and they like to open up. They opened up by giving students an uh, opportunity to read a story. In this case, this example of uh, another story called, called Orangewood Road. And they wrote their own question, feedback question for the middle school student. Do you understand what happened in the story? Do you like or dislike the outcome at the end? Elaborate on what do you think about that? And then <clears throat> some of the points about protect your safety. Turn the location setting off. Don't give out personal information. Make sure social media platform don't share that information. If you don't want to give an app your information, just put down a random birthday or phone number. So this is like a material that the high school kids they are able to prepare and with the intention to actually teach students who are younger. So it reminds me of Lindsay a lot because she cares about a lot about her younger students. And then that's when I realized, so when really see firsthand the power of that engaging these uh, students in their empathy toward people who are younger. If you get to teach your younger kids, if you get to protect your younger siblings, it's much more powerful and compelling than telling them stories about what happened to poor adults who lost their job or whose Facebook account got hacked and so on and so forth, or whose election got stolen. So if you know what I meant. So anyway, um, uh, so I learned a ton from high school students and, and, and high school teachers over the past few years about uh, teaching AI ethics in their classrooms. And I only have time to share stories about of just a handful of people. And Ellie, now she has graduated. She actually moved to Seattle and she's now helping uh, Kevin Love Fund, who is run by NBA player Kevin Love to help with people with depression and anxiety. And <clears throat> so they are piloting a program. And by the way, Ellie actually became a mom and thought uh, like, so I'm very excited for her. And Matt, so the pandemic really hit him hard. And he's a really social person, but then he's with no human contact. And he's been stuck at his home. And he, he was, then he told me that he had uh, some, he realized he needed to check himself into clinic to get some help. I think it took a lot of courage to be able to do that. And even right after his rec recovery, if I, um, so there's something that unfortunately they happened in our town. They actually had a really serious wildfire that burned down about a thousand homes, including the home the Matt is living in. But then somehow he still managed to stay really strong. And then he, uh, he reached out to me recently to look for opportunity to work. And then so we're going to have some uh, lunch to, tomorrow and to hopefully to talk about something that I could help him out. And maybe I really think he could, he could be a really uh, great teacher to, to continue to, to teach uh, students about it. And then about Lindsay, he actually told me recently that he is participating in the app design competition. So he wants to design a social app that is only for close friends and it won't let strangers join or talk to you. And it won't spread negative messages and only spread positive ones, and also won't push unreasonable beauty standard. 
and they won't show a lot of won't that the, the, the app is doesn't not gonna do. It won't show a lot of ads. But then he will he said he will use AI to help with like things like filtering mis messages and stuff. And I thought it was pretty cool. And for the um, uh, yeah, and then but then she said she actually is experiencing a really big dilemma that he says that and she's saying things like, oh, I want my app to help a lot of people in my schools, but also I, I want my app to be only for close friends. I don't want to do any advertisement for my app. So I guess it probably won't end up helping a lot of people after all. So in my head, when I wearing the hat of a professor, I was like, wow, is this actually a classic example of this contrast or this contention between utilitarian ethic that is like you want to help as many people as possible, you know, and uh, the ontology ethic that you want to help people in the right way with the respect of life. And I'm saying that Lindsay is like exactly thinking about this to this dilemma then. And, but in my heart, really in my heart, I'm not this professor, but actually as a father with two young boys, I feel there's a warmth, I feel there's an optimism in these young people that really just like the poem that was written by Kyle that I read to you earlier in uh, my presentation. And so anyway, I will just like to end my talk by uh, reading another passage from the speech that Kyle shared with me, if I can find it in my pile of stuff. So, um, <clears throat> so um, that app was the reason I met you through quarantine. To make things worse, I was put into online schooling for a year. My first year of high school was spent in the comfort of my own home. I failed most of my classes. I lost my phone halfway through the school year. And if I'm being honest, I didn't care. I didn't care about anything. Friends, gone. Grades, gone. Hopes of being successful, gone. Self-worth, gone. However, with all the distraction in my life removed, it made me realize just how amazing life is. I suddenly found myself feeling more optimistic than ever. I was happier. I no longer feel alone in the world. I look around myself and see everyone around me glued to their phones. Let me ask you this. When was the last time you sat in the back seat of a car and looked out the window? The world, the outside world is beautiful if you do pass the hate the screen brings, all the negativity on social media. And best way to do that, optimism is the key. Optimism will open the curtains and bring us to tomorrow. And this is my talk. And I thank you for your attention.